However, after having droned through the sky for 315 miles, well beyond the estimated contact point, Ring had had enough. It was getting close to returning time, and he decided to swing around and go after the one definite enemy sighted. After the past two days, Ring was understandably loath to let this opponent go at about 6.08 p.m. He attacked. It was a few hectic moments for Tanikazi, as the scout bomber Douglas dove on her. Her report shows 26 aircraft, dropping very near misses that bracketed both bows and the starboard quarter. One miss off the stern was close enough to draw blood. Bomb fragments slashed through the aft number three five-inch turret, inducing an explosion that killed the entire six-man turret crew. The reason Tanikazi rather dramatically overcounted the number of planes attacking her is that she was in fact shortly assaulted by an additional pack of dive bombers. Enterprise's composite squadron had been flying steadily west-northwest toward the reported position of the damaged Japanese carrier, strung out in a scouting line formed by nine planes of Scout Squadron 6 and seven planes of Scout Squadron 5. About 100 miles away from the presumed position of the enemy carrier, they had begun climbing. The ceiling was 13,000 feet and visibility was hazy. By 6 p.m., the expected carrier was nowhere in sight. Having overheard Ring's contact report, though, Enterprise's planes began searching to the southwest. At 6.20 p.m., a lone enemy vessel was sighted, believed to be a light cruiser of the Katori class, on course west, speeding 20 knots. Lieutenant Shumway logically decided to attack this target. It was growing dark, his planes were running low on gas, and as near as he could tell, there were no other enemy ships in the area. The end result was more trouble for the hard-pressed Tanikaze. Commander Katsumi must have shaken his head in frustration as he barked out orders for yet more evasive manoeuvres. The search for Hiryu was proving a distinctly hazardous undertaking and seemed likely to cost him his own ship before sunset. One by one, the enemy dive bombers pushed over on him like kingfishers. Bombing Squadron 3 attacked first, beginning at 6.34pm, followed in succession by Bombing Squadron 6, Scout Squadron 6, and finally Scout Squadron 5. Yet once again luck was with the Tanikaze. In this, she was aided by the growing darkness, which made it more difficult to see the fleeing ship against the dark waters. Katsumi's skill as a ship handler too was undoubted. Tanikaze went to high speed and lurched into a series of violent S-turns. The United States Navy's report affirms this, saying... Because of the cruiser's high speed, manoeuvrability, and the heavy weather conditions, a very elusive dive-bombing target was presented. As a result, most of the bombs landed fairly wide. The other thing the Americans noticed was the large volume of anti-aircraft fire, as Tanikaze's crew threw everything they had at the attackers. Their prodigious efforts were rewarded. Near the end of the last attack, one stricken scout bomber Douglas was seen by both sides crashing directly into Tanikaze's wake. With tragic irony, this scout bomber Douglas was piloted by none other than Lieutenant Adams of Scouting 5, who had produced the decisive sighting of Hiryu the preceding afternoon. More than a bit frustrated, Task Force 16's aviators turned and began the long, dangerous flight home. They would eventually be recovered well after nightfall and only after Admiral Spruance elected to take the rather bold step of turning on the carrier's deck lights to guide his men home. Spruance later explained that if planes are to be flown so late in the day that a night recovery is likely, and if the tactical situation is such that the commander is unwilling to do what is required to get the planes back safely, then he has no business launching the attack in the first place. His men, in turn, demonstrated their own worth, by completing a near-perfect recovery sequence on board the carriers. Only one aircraft was lost, running out of fuel just before landing. Both crewmen were recovered. Tanikaze, for her part, still wasn't quite done. At 6.45pm, five B-17s commenced dropping 15 608 300-pound bombs on her from 11,000 feet. She understandably counted 11 planes, as several of them made more than one run. Tanikaze was not hit, and incredibly, seems to have been indirectly responsible for knocking down a B-17. This plane, in the heat of the attack, accidentally jettisoned its bomb bay auxiliary fuel tank along with its bombs, and was never heard from again. 
A second likewise ran out of fuel on the way home and ditched. These two were the only B-17s lost in the battle. Finally, sunset came, and Tanikaze, finding nothing in the area, was understandably happy to quit the field and quickly sped westward to rejoin Nagumo. Undiscovered somewhere nearby, Chief Engineer Imune's cutter drifted morosely toward its eventual rescue at the hands of the enemy. As it happened, two other Japanese destroyers had scuttled through the waters west of Midway this afternoon, but had been lucky enough to avoid detection. These were Arashio and Asashio, hastening to join the screen of the Mikuma and Mogami. At 6pm they had signalled that after finishing refuelling, they expected to rejoin Mogami and her sister at 5am the following morning. Even if this duo had been detected, it is unlikely that they could have been attacked. Task Force 16 was through with launches for the day. It was too dark, and Asashio and her sister too far away to justify a further attempt, but Spruance knew that there would be good targets waiting in the morning. Indeed, the latest sighting reports received from Midway via Nimitz at 1941 actually said that one of Midway's patrol planes had been attacked by Japanese carrier fighters. It was true at 6.12pm, as the sun dipped toward the horizon, Lieutenant Dale S. Newell of Patrol Squadron 44 had had the dubious honour of finally sighting the Japanese main body. Zuiho's combat air patrol thereupon received their own baptism of fire by chasing off the American interloper. Lieutenant Newell had come upon combined fleet at an interesting moment. Only an hour before, the last straggling destroyers of Nagumo's fleet had rejoined the main body. The Japanese were busy receiving short action reports and cross-decking personnel. Destroyer Isokaze had pulled alongside Chikuma and was conscientiously sending over the fire and rescue party the cruiser had left behind with Soryu the previous morning. The Japanese listened nervously to the chatter indicating enemy planes overhead, but they felt that the approaching sunset would soon offer cover. Apparently it did, for other than an unknown aircraft bombing Haruna at 5pm and scoring a near miss, no other Japanese ships were attacked today. With Yamamoto, Kondo and Nagumo now all merged into one formation, combined fleet shifted from its northwest course and headed due west as dusk drew on. They proceeded slowly, while that evening the destroyers transferred Kido Butai's survivors to Nagato and Mutsu. They were heading away from Midway, but not necessarily away from battle, mindful that the enemy's pursuit might offer renewed opportunities. Yamamoto was not quite ready to give up yet. He would hold the Midway invasion forces on standby at a safe distance and see what developments the next day might bring. As dawn's early light broke on 6 June, the battered second section of Cruiser Division 7 was still struggling to clear the battle zone. Mikuma remained more or less intact, but her speed and thus her fate was tied to that of her wounded sister. Shoving aside a cataract of water from her crushed prow, Mogami was still making 14 knots and had the possibility of doing even better. The sea was moderate, and the welcome arrival of Destroyer Division 8, soon after dawn, bolstered the men's spirits still further. Yet even now Admiral Raymond Spruance was manoeuvring to abort their escape, Task Force 16 now lay 350 miles northwest of Midway. At 500, Spruance had put up a fan of 18 searching scout bomber Douglas from Enterprise, to cover his western flank out to a distance of 200 miles. It didn't take long for one of the Dauntless Airs to flush out the Japanese cruisers, radioing at 6.45am that he had spotted one battleship, one cruiser, and three destroyers steaming west at 10 knots. Besides an unaccountably slow speed estimate, though, a further distortion resulted when a garble in deciphering turned the message into a report of one carrier and five destroyers. Needless to say, this latter report, particularly its unintentional mention of a carrier, elicited immediate interest on Enterprise's bridge. The reported position of the Japanese was only 128 miles southwest of Task Force 16. However, recalling the goose chase after the damaged carrier just the day before, Spruance was determined to take no chances. He ordered cruisers Minneapolis and New Orleans to launch their float planes to maintain contact with this new carrier. However, even as these scouts were warming up, one of Hornet's scout bomber Douglas returned at 7.30am 
and dropped a message clarifying that it was in fact two cruisers and two destroyers that had been sighted. Thus, when the cruisers started catapulting their float planes at 7.45am, Spruance now thought he might be dealing with two separate enemy formations, one of which included a carrier. Spruance ordered speed increased to 25 knots on a southwest course and instructed Hornet to launch her attack group. Enterprise would follow suit as quickly as possible. Hornet already had a force of scout bomber Douglas spotted on deck for just such a contingency. Shortly before 8am, she began launching the first of 11 aircraft of bombing Squadron 8. Another 14 scout bomber Douglas, drawn mostly from Scout Squadron 8, but including one apiece from Scout Squadron 5 and Scout Squadron 6, went up right after. Eight carried 500 pounds bombs, the remainder lugged 1,000 to 367 pounders. Eight Wildcat fighters accompanied them, considering the opponent, this was a strong strike. Leading it again was Hornet's Stanhope Ring, trying for one last shot at redemption. However, the hoped-for carrier was soon to prove a chimera. After Ring's aircraft had departed, more of the morning's search aircraft began landing, and the error in transmission was quickly discovered and corrected. There was no carrier, but there was apparently big ship game out there nonetheless. Indeed, Spruance still believed that there might be two separate formations in proximity to one another. At 8.50am, the Enterprise radioed to Ring, Target may be a battleship instead of a carrier. Attack, by now the Japanese were fully aware of the way the morning was shaping up. Captain Sakiyama of Mikuma had spotted two of New Orleans's float planes and opened fire on them. The Americans kept a healthy distance, maintaining contact and guiding Ring's strike force right to their targets, which he sighted at 9.30am. As far as he could tell, though, neither of the two larger ships was a battleship. Remembering that two enemy forces had been reported, he prudently withheld his attack, instead heading west to ensure that he didn't miss any bigger game. However, the minutes ticked by, and he saw nothing. Below, the Mikuma and Magami were passing by his left side. His flight had already missed the optimum pushover point. Still seeing nothing ahead, Ring decided that one contact in the hand was worth two in the bush. He now commenced a wide circle around to begin a second approach from ahead and out of the sun. As the attack began unfolding, the Mikuma flashed word at 9.45am attacked by a large number of enemy planes and one seaplane in sight. At 9.50am Ring led his men into their dives. The Japanese ships increased speed and began spitting out anti-aircraft. As it happened, their fire proved as effective, if not more so, than that of Kido Butai's carriers two days before. Despite having no air cover, the Japanese gunners shot down two scout bomber Douglas, with the loss of both of their crews. Ring was once again destined for disappointment, as his section managed no better than a paint scraper near Miss, alongside Mikuma. Scouting 8 had a bit more success with Mogami, connecting with two bombs. One landed atop number 5 turret, killing the entire turret crew. The second smashed through the aircraft deck, and started fires in the torpedo room beneath it. Now Lieutenant Commander Saruwatari's earlier precaution of dumping Mogami's Type 93 torpedoes paid off. While the bomb hit was destructive, there were no secondary explosions, and the fire was extinguished within an hour. As for Destroyer Division 8, both destroyers were strafed but emerged otherwise unscathed. Surveying the results after reforming his aircraft, Ring answered a query from Enterprise by radioing, no aircraft carrier aircraft carrier sighted. Attacked heavy cruiser supported by three destroyers, one hit, enemy course 270, speed 25, and no air opposition. The last part was significant, as it confirmed that there was no Japanese carrier in the area. This was a disappointment, but it seemed possible that the reported battleship was still lurking out there somewhere. Watching Ring's aviators depart, Mikuma's skipper surely wished for a Japanese carrier near at hand as well, albeit for entirely different reasons. But the fact was that Captain Sakiyama's small squadron was alone on the sea, far distant from Kurita's other two cruisers, and even farther from any help the main body might provide. A quick tally of the damage was compiled, and then a situation report flashed to Yamamoto and Kondo at 10.45am. The news still wasn't all bad. Mogami had only received light damage, 
and three enemy aircraft had been shot down. However, at exactly the same moment Sakiyama was sending his report, further trouble was being sent his way. One by one, 31 Scout Bomber Douglas began rolling down Enterprise's flight deck as she followed up Hornet's strike with one of her own. Like Hornet's morning strike, this was a polyglot unit Scout Bomber Douglas from Bombing Squadron 3, Scout Squadron 5, Bombing Squadron 6, and Scout Squadron 6 were all participating. Sixteen planes of Scout Squadron 5 and Scout Squadron 6 combined to form one squadron, with planes from Bombing Squadron 6 forming a third division. With them went twelve Wildcat fighters. Overall command of the formation fell on Lieutenant Wallace Wally Short of Yorktown. At 10.57am, while Short was still orbiting Task Force 16 awaiting departure of the last of his aircraft, he received an additional message indicating that the Japanese battleship was apparently somewhat farther ahead of the assigned target, not surprisingly, he was ordered to seek it out first. A few minutes later came yet another change. Given the importance of the target, the last three torpedo planes remaining from Torpedo Squadron 6 would be coming up to join him as well. At 11.15am, the scout bomber Douglas formed up and departed, boring away westward in lazy S-turns to let the slower torpedo bomber Douglas puff along behind. The dive bombers climbed to 22,000 feet leaving the torpedo planes at low altitude, Captains Sakiyama and Soji had changed their own plans in the meantime. The implication of the continued presence of New Orleans's float planes was obvious and mandated a response. At 11am, the Mikuma radioed that they were under pursuit by enemy aircraft and surface ships. They were consequently shifting course to the southwest to make a run for Wake's air cover, the island being 710 miles distant. Yamamoto's staff on board Yamato could only listen with growing consternation and fear for the safety of the two cruisers. Their fears were well founded, because the time had finally come for Cruiser Division 7 to pay the check. At noon, Mikuma was still leading Mogami west southwest. Both ships were making close to 20 knots, with the two destroyers in screen. Great waves were being raised by Mogami's shattered bow as she bulled her way through the water at the best speed she could manage. This last gasp effort was putting a severe strain on the forward bulkheads, but Captain Soji dared not slow down now. It had been two hours since the last American attack, and they were creeping ever closer to wake. However, they were still at least a day's steaming from friendly fighter cover. And now, the instrument of their final ruin came into view. Wally Short's strike group had sighted the fleeing Japanese at 12.11pm. However, for the moment he did not alter course, the Japanese watched as the Americans flew by, heading west in search of the non-existent battleship. But even though the scout bomber Douglas were headed out of the area, coming up from astern were the American Wildcats and the three torpedo bomber Douglas of Torpedo Squadron 6. The fighter leader, Lieutenant Jim Gray, feared the torpedo bomber Douglas might attack the cruisers solo, so he led his fighters down for a closer look at the targets Short had just bypassed. The Japanese responded with another blistering anti-aircraft barrage, spitting defiance back at the Wildcats. It may well be that because of her damaged bow, Mogami appeared foreshortened and smaller than her sister. For whatever reason, though, Gray and other American pilots consistently mistook the pair for one battleship and one heavy cruiser, even though Mikuma and Mogami were identical. This had an effect on the post-battle reports the Americans would file regarding this attack. However, Gray was impressed by the robust defence and large size of Japanese cruisers. He was convinced that an oversight had been made, and that at least one of the two was the battleship that everyone was seeking this morning. He promptly radioed short, advising him to reverse course. Over the radio, Gray's pilots were remarking on the warm reception they were receiving, while Short and his men listened with growing concern. Behind them was a perfectly valid target. Ahead of their windscreens, despite excellent visibility, was nothing. All they could see was sun and empty ocean. They had already flown 30 miles west of the Japanese ships when Gray anxiously radioed that one of the past targets appeared to be a battleship. That was the last straw. With a curt signal, Short brought his entire squadron around to the east, commencing a long high-speed approach from about 21,000 feet. 
His scout bomber Douglas were descending from out of the sun and downwind, converging rapidly with the Japanese ships on their opposing course of about 240 degrees. Mikuma was still in the lead, and it was this ship that Short and most of his aviators targeted. However, as they began their approach, the Japanese formation abruptly slowed and changed course. The rearmost ship, Mogami, was coming under attack and looping out to starboard. As it developed, not all of Wally Short's squadron had, in fact, followed him on his abortive westward search. The last section in the long string of American aircraft, that of Bombing Squadron 3, had departed from the search ahead and attacked the rear heavy cruiser. Almost immediately, two bombs slammed into Mogami, one amidships on the aircraft deck and the other forward of the bridge, inflicting medium damage. However, as a result of her sister's evasive manoeuvres, Mikuma in the fore began circling to starboard to conform to Mogami. This had the effect of reversing Mikuma's relative positioning, making her now tail-end Charlie in the formation. Thus, Mikuma had her attention distracted, and as a result, the Americans caught her flat-footed. Short pushed over at 14,000 feet and was in a 70-degree dive on her when she suddenly spotted the new menace and opened a heavy stream of automatic gunfire. She would keep this up until the first bomb hit. As Mikuma came out of her starboard turn, the first hit was delivered against the roof of the number three main turret, directly in front of the bridge. The explosion shattered the turret, blowing a sheet of lethal fragments across the front of the ship's superstructure. Several officers, including the commander of the starboard anti-aircraft guns, were killed outright. Worse, this initial hit coincided precisely with Captain Sakiyama's sticking his head out a manhole cover on the top of the bridge. Severely wounded, he lost consciousness immediately and slumped backward into the bridge. Commander Takashima Hideo, Mikuma's executive officer, leapt to take charge, but two more bombs slammed home, blasting through the decks to shatter the starboard forward engine spaces. Great blasts of smoke and fire boiled up, and Mikuma was staggered. Bombs were still coming down, crashing into the sea and drenching the ship with towering columns of water. Takashima tried to increase speed and evade, but his efforts were cut short abruptly. Even before the last of short scout bomber Douglas had dropped, two more bombs blasted the aircraft deck and tore down into the port aft engine room, exploding with devastating force. Immediately, a huge fire broke out in the vicinity of the torpedo tubes. Mikuma quickly slobbered to a halt. She had been crushed by at least five direct hits and two close near misses, and possibly more. On board Megami, her officers and men watched with sinking hearts as their would-be rescuer now became substitute victim. With angry spears of fire and dark black smoke pouring from her superstructure, from Megami's bridge, Mikuma appeared so obviously finished that at 2.20pm, Megami radioed as much back to Yamamoto. Though sorely damaged herself, Mogami began closing her sister to render assistance. High above, Wally Short collected his planes and found to his delight that he had suffered no losses. Arguably, this was true only because the three torpedo bomber Douglas from Torpedo Squadron 6 prudently declined to attack when they observed the accurate anti-aircraft fire the Japanese ships were throwing up. The American torpedo plane squadrons had lost too much already, and Spruance had made it crystal clear to their pilots that they were not to risk themselves if the Japanese had so much as a single anti-aircraft gun in operation. As a result, the American flyers began their journey back to Enterprise at full strength, having almost certainly wrecked one of their targets. Almost certainly, because even in the immediate aftermath of the American attack, there remained still some slight doubt as to Mikuma's fate. True, she was dead in the water, but two of her four engine rooms remained operable, and it might be possible to get her underway again if her fires were put out. There seemed to be some hope of the latter, at least initially. Though fires were raging amidships, she appeared to be on an even keel and was not settling visibly. Her executive officer semaphored Mogami, I am taking command of the ship, and it seemed that order might be returning. Captain Soji did not rule out the prospect of his Mogami, or the destroyers, towing Mikuma to safety if they could avoid further attacks. But within an hour of the attack, the matter was rendered moot. Just before 1.58pm, 
The fires around Mikuma's torpedo storage racks finally precipitated the calamity that was almost inevitable from the moment the first bomb landed amidships. With an appalling eruption, a number of Mikuma's torpedoes exploded. The entire aircraft deck was reduced to a blackened tangle of junk, and even the mainmast came crashing down on top of the wreckage. The ship's superstructure was left almost unrecognisable from the funnel back to number four turret. Far worse than the damage topside, though, was the damage below decks. Although not obvious at first, the explosion and earlier bomb hits in the port machinery spaces had ruptured the bottom of the cruiser. Mikuma started sagging to port and settling deeper into the water. The men on board Mogami were under no illusions regarding the inevitable outcome of this misfortune. At 1.58pm, she morosely radioed word of Mikuma's explosion and opined that there was little prospect of her being recovered. Mikuma might be doomed, but Combined Fleet was convinced there was still an opportunity to avenge her, and they were determined to exploit it. Just before Wally Short's attack struck home, the main Japanese fleet had broken formation and detached a fast-striking element to lunge south in support of Sakiyama. From the Japanese perspective, 6 June offered the possibility of a renewed carrier battle, this time supported by their full surface strength. At 1.40pm, Kondo sent orders to his occupation force and cruiser Division 8, the barest details of which convey something of the Japanese renewed excitement and hope of snatching victory from defeat. Main force of occupation force, less battleship Division 3 and destroyer squadron 2, with cruiser Division 8, destroy enemy carrier force and assist Mogami and Mikuma. Course West, supply force is waiting at position Foucault 39, 30 degrees, 10 minutes north, 167 degrees, 50 minutes east. Zuiho prepares to attack an enemy aircraft carrier, preparing to utilise the full strength of all available seaplanes. Three-seaters to search, two-seaters to attack enemy carrier with two ordinary semi-armour-piercing, bombs each. One of the most incredible things about this order is Zuiho being ordered to prepare her aircraft for an attack. In fact, Kondo had already ordered her at 12.15am to move with a single destroyer to a position to deliver air attacks to cover Cruiser Division 7's retreat. Zuiho would later turn in an illustrious battle record, and her captain, Obayashi Sueo, was destined to become a respected carrier skipper. Yet the fact was that Zuiho just had nine torpedo bombers to throw into the fray, along with six Zeros and six older A5M fighters. It is stunning that the Japanese were even considering offering battle under these terms, particularly given the fact that Yamamoto was even now receiving signals that Mikuma and Mogami were undergoing a heavy air attack. At this point, the Americans had at least three times as much firepower as Zuiho, Hosho and all the float planes the Japanese could scrape together. To say that Yamamoto was grasping at straws was putting it mildly, and it's lucky for the Japanese that they didn't come within range of Spruance's warbirds this day. Had they done so, the misfortunes they had suffered on 4 June would almost certainly have been sharply augmented. Yamamoto didn't know it, but his forces had just scored their biggest success of the entire battle. Throughout the morning, Captain Elliot Buckmaster's efforts to save the wounded Yorktown had slowly been yielding fruit. Destroyer Hammond had nuzzled up to her starboard side and put the captain's salvage party on board her just before dawn. The destroyer still lay alongside, providing power and support as Yorktown's crew busied themselves with remedying her various maladies. Five other destroyers circled the carrier in ceaseless patrol. Yorktown's fires were now out, and her port list had already been considerably abated by both portable pumps and counter-flooding her starboard tanks. Topside, men were cutting away many of her portside guns so as to reduce the weight on her threatened flank. In the hangar, other sailors were lowering spare aircraft from the overheads and shoving them over the side. Most important of all, Minesweeper Virio had secured a tow line to Yorktown at 1.8pm on the 5th and was dragging her clear at three knots. If things kept up, Captain Buckmaster might yet pull off one of the war's more masterful demonstrations of damage control. However, even as the Americans were labouring with a will, Lieutenant Commander Tanabe and I-168 were moving in to put an end to this particular feel-good story. 
This was precisely the sort of mission that Japanese submarines were built and trained to perform hunting and sinking enemy capital ships. Japanese fleet boats were neither nimble nor terribly quiet, but there was no denying the lethality of their torpedoes, if they could be put to use. And as luck would have it, Tanabe would benefit from an unexpectedly promising set of circumstances in which to set up his attack. Having crept north toward his quarry all during the 5th, he had welcomed the opportunity to travel on the surface once nightfall came. Throughout the night he cruised ahead at 16 knots, trusting in the sharp eyes and superb night optics of his lookouts to sight his quarry before he was sighted in turn. Below decks, the crew had completed preparations for an attack. Many of the men were too keyed up to sleep, and instead waited anxiously, chattering among themselves as the night wore away. At 4.10am, Tanabe's confidence in his lookouts had been rewarded, as one of them shouted out that he had a contact off the starboard bow. The skipper scanned the eastern horizon himself in the growing light of dawn. Finally, there could be no doubt of it, the wounded American carrier gradually resolved itself, almost precisely where Tanabe had expected to find her. Even with his submarine still concealed in the westward gloom, and his target silhouetted by the rising sun, Tanabe reacted cautiously, chopping his speed to twelve knots to cut his wake. He submerged at 6am as increasing visibility made his approach ever more perilous. Tanabe had been determined to close as near as possible to the enemy carrier before launching his attack. Yet it would be tricky, six destroyers guarded her, and he had a healthy respect for American sonar, as luck would have it, though acoustic conditions were miserable. One of the American destroyer men afterward lamented that propeller noises could not be heard at any range. This was probably an exaggeration, but there was no denying that the Americans were completely unaware of I-168 stealthy approach. Tanabe was concerned as well by the telltale wake his periscope might make on the smooth waters and resolved to use it only sparingly during the middle portion of his approach once every half hour and then only for a single five-second exposure. Instead of the scope, he would navigate using his sound gear and by dead reckoning. This was a bold move, but in his estimation of the relative risks, Tanabe was probably right again. His greatest danger under the acoustic conditions then pertaining was really from the hundreds of eyes on board the various American warships guarding the crippled carrier. Getting I-168 inside the ring of pickets to set up his attack was far from easy. Tanabe took a visual fix on the target at 15,000 metres and then started moving in. Over the next four hours, he risked only occasional glances with his periscope as he picked his way inward. But the fleeting visual sightings he did make revealed something odd. He was not closing on the target in the fashion he had expected. Virio's low-speed towing of Yorktown was apparently fouling up his calculations ever so slightly. Finally, it was time to risk penetrating the inner picket line, which was about 2,000 metres from the carrier. Tanabe knew that no further periscope sightings would be possible until the final attack. The American escorts were pinging away with their sonar, and Tanabe and his men could hear them clearly. Tanabe rigged the vessel for depth charging just in case, but again their luck held. I-168 apparently benefited from a strong thermal layer, because none of the American destroyers got so much as a whisper of an echo back from her hull. Finally, Tanabe decided it was time to chance a sighting and raised his scope for a quick look. He was stunned to discover Yorktown practically atop him, a mere 500 metres away. He could clearly discern the faces of the American sailors on board her, hurriedly retracting his scope. He realised he was now too close to the target the torpedoes wouldn't arm before striking home. He had to come about and open the range a bit. This he did, finally reaching a position 1,500 metres from the carrier's starboard side. Tanabe noticed that during this critical juncture, the American destroyers seemed to have ceased sonar operations entirely. Tanabe knew that I-168 would get only one attack, and he was determined to make it count. The captain decided to forgo firing a spread wider than two degrees. This was an all-or-nothing attack. He would fire his fish in a very tight pattern and hope that a number of them struck home. At about 1.31pm, Tanabe let fly with his first pair of Type 89 torpedoes, followed seconds later by the second pair. 
He immediately dove to I-168 maximum depth of 100 metres and headed toward the target, figuring that it would be safer if he were in direct proximity to a sinking carrier than if he were out in the open where the American destroyers could get at him. In the sub's cramped, sweaty control room, the men counted out the seconds since the torpedo's launch. About 40 seconds later, they were rewarded with the sound of three powerful detonations. Tanabe's attack was devastating. The Americans had sighted the torpedoes inbound, but there was nothing they could do about it. With no engine power of her own, and still being towed by Virio, the men on board Yorktown had little choice but to watch the fish come in. Hammond, still nestled as she was against Yorktown's starboard quarter, was in exactly the same position. Tanabe's first fish hit Hammond dead amidships in the number two fire room, blowing her in two. Ripping away her mooring lines from Yorktown, the destroyer drifted astern and started sinking immediately. Her crew began jumping into the water as fast as they could. Unfortunately, Hammond's own depth charges detonated shortly after her stern left the surface. The resulting underwater explosions crushed many of her survivors. Hammond lost 84 of her crew of 228. Two other torpedoes rushed underneath Hammond and slammed into Yorktown at frames 84 and 95 on her starboard side, while the fourth missed a stern. These two hits finished Yorktown, externally. Her condition didn't change all that noticeably Tanabe's fish had struck on the opposite side of Hashimoto's, which had the effect of counter-flooding the ship still further and bringing her list down. But Yorktown's flooding could no longer be contained. Captain Buckmaster had his salvage party shut every watertight door they could, but they couldn't reach them all. The men could hear the sea pounding against the ship's centerline bulkhead in the spaces the latest torpedo hits had flooded. At 3.50pm, Buckmaster decided that it was best to remove the salvage party to the safety of the Virio. He would wait out the evening in hopes that when the larger fleet tug Navajo arrived, he would be able to put the salvage party on board again and complete the repairs necessary to get her home. It was to be a forlorn hope, Tanaby, for his part, had expected the real battle to begin after he had launched his torpedoes. Destroyers Gwyn, Monaghan and Hughes did not disappoint him, subjecting I-168 to a series of violent depth-charging attacks over the next two hours. By the end of it, I-168's batteries were practically dead, some of the battery casings having cracked and spilled sulfuric acid into the seawater of the bilge, thereby releasing chlorine gas into the sub's hull. The fumes grew so bad that even the rats crawled out from the bilges to escape. Her compressed air supply had been reduced to the barest margins necessary to blow the tanks, and her diving planes weren't working properly. One of the forward torpedo tube seals had leaked, partially flooding the torpedo room and trimming the sub by the bow. Her lights and then even her emergency lights had failed, leaving the bridge crew operating by hand lamps in the increasingly foul air. By the time the Americans were through, I-168 had essentially been reduced to a wreck. Yet just at the moment when Tanabe had no choice but to surface, the Americans broke off their attack. Tanabe came up at 4.40pm, prepared for a last-ditch fight on the surface with his deck gun, but when he emerged from the conning tower hatch, the American destroyers were retreating, about 10,000 metres away. Yorktown was nowhere in sight, leading Tanabe to believe that he had sunk her. Not wishing to stay in the neighbourhood, he ordered I-168 to start her diesels so that she could move away on the surface. This was perhaps Tanabe's one order this day that was less than inspired, for the cloud of diesel smoke as the engines were fired up brought the American destroyers down on I-168 again. Tanabe had no choice but to run for it. The Americans bracketed his weaving boat with gunfire. However, the light was fading, and the heavy engine exhaust created a small smoke screen for I-168 to hide behind. Though the range was closing inexorably, none of the Americans' shots hit. Finally, having had bare time to vent the sub's atmosphere and recharge her air flasks somewhat, Tanabe took her down again, reversing course in his smoke cloud as he did so. This time, the Americans seemed to have lost her. Their depth charging was desultory and ill-aimed. Eventually, Tanabe was able to sneak away for good. He would make it home to Cure, his fuel tanks nearly dry, 
having pulled off one of the most impressive submarine victories of the entire war. Meanwhile, Mikuma's executive officer, Takashima, was beginning to come to the same conclusions regarding his ship's likely fortunes that Mogami had already conveyed to Yamamoto. Mikuma was visibly settling, her midships were a raging inferno, and there didn't appear to be any means of bringing her fires under control. After hearing some anxious-sounding damage control reports on the smoke-filled bridge, Takashima gave the order to prepare to abandon ship. He instructed the ship's repair parties to suspend their work aft and instead begin dragging shoring timbers to the ship's foredeck to construct life rafts. Mogami and Arashio were close at hand, while Asashio circled to provide air defence. For the moment, no enemy aircraft were in sight, and after a few more minutes, Takashima gave the order to evacuate. Since Mikuma was still burning and exploding, it was too dangerous for Arashio to approach. Mikuma's men would have to make their way over to the rescue ships, either by swimming or on board rafts. The sailors started throwing timbers, vests and anything else that might float over the side. Then they began jumping into the sea. On the ship's foredeck, the gravely injured Captain Sakiyama and others of the wounded were the first to be lowered onto the first raft. With the second raft went Mikuma's paymaster and her air officer, taking important documents and materials, splashing into the calm sea, the rafts shoved off for Arashio. Commander Takashima watched all this stoically from Mikuma's ruined bridge. The reason he had sent the important materials with the second raft was that he would not be accompanying them himself. Though Captain Sakiyama yet lived and technically remained in command, the actual responsibility for Mikuma had fallen to Takashima. It was he who had directed the ship's final efforts. As such, he saw it as his duty to share Mikuma's fate. So he would, and unfortunately for the Japanese, so would many hundreds of others. In fact, the bulk of Mikuma's crew would be lost, for hardly had Captain Sakiyama's raft been hauled on board Arashio when a third wave of enemy aircraft came roaring in at 2.45pm to attack the hapless little force. These were 23 Scout Bomber Douglas sent up from Hornet at 1.45pm, with Task Force 16 having now closed the range to the Japanese considerably, each plane could carry the heavier 1,000 pounds bomb. This last strike didn't have fighter cover, but by then it was clear that none was needed. Blazing Mikuma was a sitting duck. Mogami and Arashio, currently hove to near her, would be in nearly as much trouble if they didn't clear out immediately. Frantically, the rescue ships began moving away from the stricken cruiser. Left behind in the water were hundreds of men, cheated at the chance for life just when it appeared they would be rescued. Hundreds of others still remained on board the shattered Mikuma, some of them by their own preference. One of the latter was the commander of the main battery fire control centre, Lieutenant Koyama Masao. When Takashima ordered the abandoned ship, Koyama refused to go, and instead asked his senior petty officer to be his second as he committed harakiri ritual self-termination atop a forward gun turret. Having not been able to see his guns smash the enemy, he could at least perform this final service. Against the tragic backdrop of Mikuma's loss, many Japanese subsequently found some comfort in the telling of Lieutenant Koyama's heroic dedication to his duty. If the indications are correct, Koyama was already dead by the time the third attack wave struck the vessel. The American bombers dove at around 3 p.m. Mogami and Arashio did not have a chance to move too far from Mikuma before the enemy was upon them the ocean churning into froth around all three ships from exploding bombs and bullets. The Americans pressed their attack with the same ferocity as before, but not so accurately. Even so, both cruisers were hit again, and one of the destroyers as well. Destroyer Arashio took a bomb near her number three turret aft. Tragically, it exploded among the massed survivors of Mikuma, who had just been pulled from the water. Thirty-seven men were killed outright and the commander of Destroyer Division 8, Commander Ogawa Nobuki, was wounded. This same hit started a fire and knocked out Arashio's steering. Fortunately for the destroyer, no further damage was forthcoming, and the fire was soon extinguished. Though forced to resort to manual steering, Arashio was subsequently able to escape, following Mogami and Asashio west. Her sister Asashio had not been struck directly, but had lost 22 men to strafing. 
Megami took a bomb on the seaplane deck, which started a horrendous fire near the ship's sick bay. All the doctors and orderlies were either killed outright or wounded, leaving the wounded men unable to save themselves as the fires roared in. Worse yet, this was at least the third hit near the aircraft deck in the same day, and the bulkheads had been badly warped by the blasts. As a result, many of the escape hatches in the vicinity had been damaged. The conflagration was spreading, and Lieutenant Commander Saruwatari once again made the tough call of taking the apparently unmerciful step and ordering the entire compartment sealed off by closing all the undamaged hatches around it. This wrenching decision gave damage control the crucial edge they needed. At length, the raging fire was checked and gradually brought under control. Saruwatari later recalled that when the compartments were reopened, it was found that several men had indeed been trapped and perished there. Their bodies were found contorted in their last throes next to the dogged hatches. One sub-lieutenant had clearly committed Harakiri to end his life before the fires burned him alive. Saruwatari trembled with great sorrow to see the bodies of his shipmates thus, but Megami's damage control officer had once again made the critical decision that saved his ship. Fortunately, despite the bomb hit and fire, Megami's engines remained operable. After a series of quick inquiries with the two destroyers, Captain Soji took stock of the situation and decided his course of action. At 3 p.m., Megami radioed the word of the third attack and reported that she, Mikuma, and Arashio had sustained bomb hits. Mikuma was done for, and the same would hold true for Megami if she didn't vacate the area immediately. More than three hours of daylight remained, meaning that further attacks might be forthcoming. Thus, with heavy hearts among the men, at 3.25 p.m., Mogami set a course due west with both destroyers, leaving Mikuma and her crew to their fates. Between them, the three ships had only managed to pull her dying skipper and two thirty-nine other officers and men on board. By some miracle, Mogami's speed mounted steadily until she was making around twenty knots. Given her damaged state, this was rather incredible, a fact that was remarked on by Ugaki, who Riley noted, at 3.25, Megami reported that she was heading due west at 20 knots to lure the enemy toward our main force. That Megami, with her bow damaged, managed to put up such a high speed is partly because her damage control has progressed, and also partly because she made a desperate effort to get out of a trap. Megami would make good her escape, rejoining Kondo's second fleet the next day. Though her fire amidships had been contained, it wasn't totally extinguished until several hours after sunset. Later, dockyard workers found 800 large or small holes in portside, the effect of which was to turn the ship's flank into something like a honeycomb. Surprisingly, Mogami's casualties totaled only nine officers and 81 petty officers and men killed, with another 101 wounded. She was fortunate indeed to have survived at all, and at the top of the list of reasons why must stand the courageous actions of her damage control officer, Lieutenant Commander Saruwatari. Left behind by her consorts, Mikuma continued burning and slowly settling. She lingered on for at least four hours or more, increasingly heeled over to port, but not trimmed noticeably by either the bow or stern. No Japanese warship would ever see her again, but her last hours would achieve graphic immortality thanks to the United States Navy. This latter fame came about because the American pilots returning to Task Force 16 could not agree on what it was that they had attacked. Many of the aviators were convinced Mikuma was a battleship, while others thought she was a cruiser of some kind. There was even less agreement on Mogami's identity, and given her smashed bow, this is perhaps not surprising. Spruance listened to these conflicting reports with growing impatience, for if his men had missed the battleship previously reported, he wanted to know about it while there was yet time for a final strike. Finally, at 3.53pm, Enterprise launched two scout bomber Douglas to photo recon the targets and settle the argument. The Japanese ships were by now little more than 90 miles away, but there wasn't much time to get the job done. Dusk was approaching. However, there was still plenty of light at 5.15pm when the pair of scout bomber Douglas arrived above the stricken Japanese cruiser. She was floating forlornly in the hauntingly beautiful glow of the coming sunset. They marked Mikuma's position as 29 degrees, 28 minutes north, 
173 degrees, 11 minutes east. The planes circled slowly at about 100 feet as the camera shutters snapped, freezing Mikuma in all her dreadful agony. Though Megami was now long gone, the photoplanes did see her far on the western horizon, in position 29 degrees, 24 minutes north, 172 degrees, 20 minutes east. On a westerly course, they also noted two destroyers with her, apparently trying to screen the damaged cruiser with smoke. Shortly thereafter, the Americans left Mikuma to her fate. One of her few survivors would later recall that it was about dusk when her list to port began to increase more rapidly. Finally, with a great billow of smoke and steam, she turned onto her port side and sank, the first Japanese cruiser to be lost in the war. The approximate time and position were 7.30 p.m. at 29 degrees 28 minutes north, 173 degrees 11 minutes east. Partly because of the ferocity of the fires and explosion, but mostly because of the curtailment of the rescue operation, the loss of life upon Mikuma's sinking was extremely heavy. A full 700 officers and men of her nominal crew of 888 perished. Included among them was her captain. As if his spirit was seeking to hasten to rejoin his fallen warriors, Captain Sakiyama Shakao would later succumb to his wounds and die on board Suzuya on 13 June. Further west, Captain Soji, on board Mogami, did make one last attempt to avert the loss of life he knew would accrue from Mikuma's sinking. After sunset, he ordered Asashio to return and make every effort to rescue Mikuma's survivors and later rejoin us. Asashio apparently did so, but found nothing in the darkness apart from dark waters covered with even darker oil. According to her log, not even one survivor could be rescued. Yet two men ultimately escaped the fate of their ship and were eventually rescued by the submarine Trout on 9 June. One was Chief Radio Man Yoshida Katsuichi, the other was a third-class fireman named Ishikawa Kanichi. When rescued, Yoshida was suffering from crushed ribs and required hospitalization, and could provide few details of Mikuma's final hours. Ishikawa, however, was only 21 years old and in good health after Mikuma went down. He and Yoshida found themselves with 17 other sailors on a raft. They drifted through that night and all the next day, one by one, all but these two had succumbed to their wounds or the lack of food and water. The Japanese did not know it, but by the evening of the 6th, the Battle of Midway was all but over from the victor's point of view. Admiral Spruance had decided he had pushed his luck far enough. His carrier forces had now reached a point over 400 miles west of Midway. The risk of submarines and air attack was growing with each mile. He was also determined not to be drawn into range of Wake Island's bombers, nor to blunder into Yamamoto's powerful surface guns, both of which aims the Japanese were energetically trying to bring about. More concretely, the majority of his destroyers were getting critically low on fuel. Accordingly, he gave the order at 7.07pm for Task Force 16 to reverse course, suspend any further chase and head for Pearl. All that remained for the Americans now was to continue their anxious search for survivors on the vast ocean. The Japanese, however, were as yet unaware of their opponent's decision to withdraw, and for them it would take one more day for the curtain to fall. Dusk on the 6th on board Yamato found Yamamoto and his staff in a state of growing unease. From where they sat, the American carrier fleet appeared to be in pursuit, and there was now a concern that the invasion force itself might soon be endangered. Preliminary estimates had concluded that the American force harrying the Mikuma group contained one or two carriers with accompanying cruisers. But this was only part of the enemy force, at least when the available intelligence was collated. The Japanese now believed that no less than five or six American carriers had been concentrated in the Midway area during the battle, out of which only two had been destroyed so far. The Japanese considered it reasonable to assume that even counting their battle losses, the enemy still had three or four carriers, including converted ones on hand. Of these, it was further assumed that at least one regular carrier, two converted carriers, several destroyers and cruisers, were in immediate pursuit of the Japanese forces. It was guessed that these American carriers would first finish off Megami and the two destroyer division eight destroyers. Then, after temporarily withdrawing east, 
It was expected that they would turn again and attack the invasion force on the morning of the 7th. This would never happen. Accordingly, at 3.50pm, Yamamoto decided he would take the main body south after Kondo to guard against this worst-case scenario. Simultaneously, he hoped to lure the enemy carriers within range of Wake Island's bombers. With any luck, a close night engagement could be forced in this way too. The alternative was to risk waiting until the morning of 7 June, braving a hail of enemy air attacks, and then hoping to charge into the enemy's midst. If all the available planes from Zuiho and Hosho could somehow destroy the enemy's flight decks, the main body might make it into gun range. Doing so, however, would require rescheduling the fleet's appointed refueling rendezvous a second time. This had originally been scheduled for morning of the 6th, but had been moved back 24 hours to the morning of the 7th. Now it was shifted again, and the tankers told to proceed to a different locale by the next afternoon, with fueling most likely to occur on the 8th. It was likewise decided to shift the tanker train further south, as Ugaki feared that while Kondo was rushing south through fog at 20 knots, he was not paying attention to anything other than rescuing the second half of the 7th Cruiser Division. In other words, in his zest to rescue Mogami Kondo might well run out of fuel. In fact, Kondo's wasn't the only formation in such danger. Yamamoto's own destroyers were running low as well, making the refueling of Destroyer Squadron 3 and Destroyer Squadron 10 absolutely essential. The only way to do so was from the fleet's battleships, and shortly after 5pm, the main body swung around to course 040 and began refueling its escorts. During the same period, the opportunity was taken to shift more of Kido Butai's survivors from the crowded destroyers to Nagato and Mutsu. Finally, after each destroyer had taken on an average of 150 tonnes of fuel, refuelling was suspended at 11.30pm. Fifteen minutes after midnight, Yamato came about and resumed her dash southward at 18 knots. In these early morning hours of 7 June, Yamamoto tried to grab whatever rest he could, but it was difficult, for he was suffering from an acute stomachache later discovered to be an infestation of roundworms. Under the circumstances, the chief's condition concerned Ugaki and his staff almost as much as the possibility of contact with the enemy. There was one bit of good news, though. From the north came word that Hosogaya's Aleutians force had made a successful surprise landing on Kiska Island at 1.20am.